From studios at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, this is Fourth and State. In this edition, an interview with Patience Rogensack, a state Supreme Court justice who is running for re-election. I'm David Haynes. I'm the opinions editor at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Welcome to the special edition of Fourth and State. We're joined today by Justice Patience Rogan Sack of the state Sup- Supreme Court. Uh, she's running for re-election in the April election in just a few weeks. Justice, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to get to uh, a bit of news that was in our newspaper in the last day or so. Um, last fall, you suggested that fellow justices sign a letter uh, to the citizens of the state essentially apologizing for the altercation that occurred. I wonder what you were hoping to accomplish uh, with that letter. Well, the letter arose out of a very unfortunate incident between Justice Bradley and Justice Prosser in June of 2011. And that matter proceeded through an investigation by uh, a district attorney deciding not to proceed on it and then Mm -hmm. ending up at the Judicial Commission where there were charges filed against uh, Justice Prosser. Because we have a statute, 757.19.2b, that says if you are a material witness, you cannot be a judge. And also because the common law of the state of Wisconsin is that every person deserves an unbiased, independent decision maker. Um, I could see that we were not going to be able to proceed through the Judicial Commission because the eventual decision maker is going to be the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And during that incident, there were six justices there. The incident really breaks my heart. I mean, it was very unfortunate for the two people involved, but it so diminished the court. In, in the public's view, so diminished it. Um, and I really believe that the court needs to clear the decks with the public on this. Mm-hmm. So um, <coughs> we have a, a schedule where we start up sitting together the first Tuesday after Labor Day, and then June 30th, we don't sit together. And I always have summer projects every summer. So in July and August, I had some time where I didn't have to be doing things with other members of the court. And I did some research on the court's um, inherent authority to discipline its own members, hoping to find some things that might be helpful. And what I found is that the court does have the inherent authority to discipline its members. And I thought it would be helpful to get a discussion going with members of the court to see if there was some way we could, all of us, agree on some mechanism for clearing the decks with the public on this just awful incident and trying to repair some of the damage that was done to the court as an institution, irrespective of what happened to the justices, just for the court as an institution. So what I decided after my research, I wrote a long email was really like a memo, but it was on an email. And I'd done a lot of research and had legal foundations for what I suggested, is that we all sign a letter, basically a public apology, which is, you know, acknowledging that that conduct is just so inappropriate and assuring the public that they could rely on us to uh, respond and react to one another in ways that are appropriate to the office they give us the honor to Mm -hmm. hold. Um, And I said, it doesn't have to be my letter, but I wrote a letter, and I hoped that we would be able to come to some conclusion. At the start of this term, the Chief Justice would read it from the bench before oral argument, and we could move on, and we could begin to repair the damage that was done to the court as an institution. So my focus was really on the court as an institution, because I think there's been a lot of damage done to it. Um, I didn't get a consensus uh, from everybody that that's what they wanted to do. Um, I am hopeful we will continue to talk about it. With this campaign ongoing, I haven't been able to get back again and try to get us all together and sit down in conference and say, if this wasn't the way to proceed, how should we proceed? Because we have that obligation, I believe, to Mm -hmm. the public. Um, So it was my efforts at trying to get something to go forward. It didn't have to be my letter, and I suggested if other people had a better suggestion, I I was happy to hear Mm -hmm. that. Um, 
I just haven't had the bandwidth, frankly, to pick this up again and go. But it's very, very important, and I will proceed further on it because I think the court has an obligation to the public. Mm -hmm. You just talked about the uh, public's perception of, of that incident and yeah. the court in general, and there's been a lot of talk about dysfunction. Do you perceive it as a dysfunction in the court? What can you do to, to change that? Or are things, you know, are the things fine now? Or? You know, there are two things that, that go into your question. Mm -hmm. The first is the court as an institution. And I have to tell you, that's what's closest to my heart. It's more important than anybody who sits on the court now or will ever sit on the court. Because if we lose the public's confidence and reliance on the court as an institution, everybody loses. I mean, there's just no upside to that. So that's what's closest to my heart. Mm -hmm. In regard to personal interactions since June of 2011, there have been no inappropriate personal interactions. We do our work, we meet, we have oral arguments, we argue through the cases. And when I say argue, that's like a lawyer's term. Mm -hmm. We're not mean or yelling or shouting. Right, sure. or, you know, if, if the court were <coughs> such, then, then an atmosphere where people did awful things like what occurred, I wouldn't be asking for another 10 years. I could do a few other things. You know, but that I, wasn't the only incident. I mean, there, were, there was also a uh, prosser allegedly called Abramson. He, he, he did say Davidson. that. That was in 2010, okay. February of 2010. What I'm saying to you is Since the, the court is really trying to work in an appropriate fashion, and I think we're, we're doing that. I mean, we're deciding the cases. Now, what do I think needs to be done? I think we need to get out and tell the public the positive things that we are doing as an institution to better serve the public. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, the court sets the budget for the entire judicial branch, not just the Supreme Court. And I happen to like fingers and numbers, and um, when I first came on the court and we did our first biennial budget, we got three or four sheets and a paper, and we were asked to approve the budget, and I said, well, where's the rest of the budget? I don't know if these are good suggestions or not. So I got the budget. I read it. The suggestions were very good. Um, that was fine. Next biennial budget comes around. I, again, I get just a few sheets of paper, and I said to my staff, oh, come on, you know me better than that. I've got to see the whole thing, or I don't know how to evaluate what you're asking me to look at. Mm -hmm. It became clear to me that the court needed earlier involvement in the budgeting process rather than coming in later after staff had done so much along the way. So I began talking to my colleagues, you know, we should have a finance committee. Legislature has a finance committee. Executive branch does. We should have a finance committee to get involved very early in the process. You know, with money getting very tight, I talked to my colleagues, 7-0, we all agreed to set up the first Supreme Court Finance Committee in the history of the state. It allows us to be more careful stewards of the public's money. We have more to work through on that. We're just kind of figuring out how to use it, how we can best serve the public. Also, our opinions are really pokey getting out. And I came from the Court of Appeals, which is a very quick turnaround court. Um, and so when I came after the first year on the Supreme Court, I was really surprised at how slow we were getting our opinions out. So I wrote a memo to everyone telling them how much I enjoyed working with everyone and making some suggestions how we might be able to move things forward and not get everything out in June. And that was really greeted with a thud and a couple of, well, we don't do things that way here. But you know, I kept talking to people and, and trying to persuade them to make some changes. Three years ago, we'd mandated only, I think about 13 or 14 opinions by June 1st. That meant everything else from the 58 or 59 opinions we did, we're gonna come down in that month. and. I finally then got them to say, okay, let's try one of Rogan Sachs' suggestions. I mean, if it doesn't work, you don't have to keep doing it. We tried one. The next year we bumped it up to, I think, about 23 by June 1st. And then last year we had spent a lot of time philosophizing in front of Wisconsin Eye, which was fine. But I persuaded my colleagues that we should just use the time in front of Wisconsin Eye to continually openly discuss rules petitions for how we changed our rules, but to take the time we had been using, philosophizing, and use it on our opinions, and we did that. And this June 1st, 
we got 35 or 36 out. So it makes a difference how you spend your time. And we need to go around and tell the public, we're looking at them. We're trying to focus outward and how can the court better serve the public. So I think those things will help to improve the image of the court. But I still believe the court itself, I think unanimously, needs to clear the decks with the public and acknowledge the wrongfulness of the conduct that occurred. Should it open more proceedings to the, to the public? What do you mean by that? Well, the administrative rules discussions. And well, we have all of our administrative rules discussions in the public. None are in private. Okay. We didn't change that. Okay. So, I mean, that's basically what we've, what we've always done. Um, Did the infighting cause a slowdown in the number of opinions that you came? I don't think so, and I think you had political facts do a check on that. I think uh, Professor Falone alleges it did, but yeah. you had a fact check, and that was found to be false. Um, you know, since I've come on the court, the workload has slowed down a lot in the circuit court and the Court of Appeals, and you can get those numbers from our Director of State Courts. I couldn't begin to tell you what they are. I think it may have something to do with the economy. It may also have something to do with the fact that we have a lot of mediation programs now, so we do try to get people to resolve their own disputes because it's in many ways better when both people are happier with the result. Which yeah, he they cites tend to be. the number of cases decided as going from something like 85 to 90 a year in the mid 2000s to more like 65, 70. I mean, it, those numbers might yeah. not be quite right, but he and he points to dysfunction on the court as yeah. being a reason for a productivity decline. Yeah, there decline. isn't there isn't a productivity decline. We okay. take every case that is of statewide concern mm -hmm. that's brought to us. I think for the last few years, it's been plus or minus 60. We mm -hmm. also add to that a lot of lawyer discipline cases. I think mm -hmm. we do more than 100 cases most year, but you have to look at the clerk of courts for the numbers because I can't tell you and I don't want to tell mm -hmm. you a number that's sure. not an accurate number and I don't so know the accurate what, so number. So is the 60s, is that like the new normal? You, you, see you know, that? that's what we've had for the last quite a few years, at least the last three or four, but look at your political fact check guy. He went back and looked at all mm -hmm. that. He did talk to our director of state courts and he did get the numbers so mm -hmm. he's he's a better person to rely on than me. But you know we take every case of statewide concern that comes to us so it, it doesn't really have anything to do with that and we we do our work well. I mean when I say we argue about the cases you know the Supreme Court is not a team function like the legislature is. You get all the Republicans, they want to do a bill, or all the Democrats and they want to do a bill. We are elected to independently review every case that comes before us and give our independent view first to our colleagues and then hopefully if we can come to a consensus, we do. And if not, we write separate opinions if we take the case. But we are elected to be independent persons on a decisional making capacity. We each study the cases independently long before we talk to each other. So, you know, it's a different, it really is a different function. And we help each other by our different points of view. I don't know how all you proceed, but I can tell you personally, I learn more in a discussion with my colleagues when some of them don't agree with me, because then I'm sure I'm really considering the other side of the issue very carefully. You know, I work with six very smart people. They are very smart, and I respect all of their points of view. So when your opponent talks about a fractured court in terms of five different opinions being issued on a decision, yeah. that doesn't bother you? That no, you know, if you go back and look at the U.S. Supreme <coughs> Court, they, they tend to be issuing a lot of decisions, too. Um, I think some people write more than others, and that's the way they see their office. The Chief Justice writes on almost everything. Mm -hmm. Even if she agrees with you, she tends to write on your case. That's okay. That's okay. how she sees her office, you know. I don't tend to write as much. I write if I think the court's going off on the wrong track, or if there's something I wish the majority would consider, even though I'm with the majority because I want to keep that issue alive so that later on maybe we will take it up and look at it. Mm -hmm. Um, but everybody sees why they should write separately a little bit different. I, I don't really have a problem with that, frankly. It goes back to the issue of volume. I mean, do you think the volume of cases is less important than the, the quality of the cases? I mean, I mean, some people would argue that they don't care how many cases there are, yeah. just so long as the ones that get decided are decided yeah. well. 
I think whether you take a lot or a few, you should always do the very best work you can do on each and every case. But don't you think that, I'm maybe expecting the argument that you could yeah. do a better job if yeah. you didn't have as many cases to decide. Well, I think, I, I think the court does good work, you know. I mean, I'm not one to throw aspersions on, even when my colleagues don't agree with me. I think that they write opinions that, that they feel strongly about, and I do think that helps to develop the law. If our cases are not as many as we took back in 2000 when I was on the Court of Appeals, if you look at the workload of the Court of Appeals and the workload of the circuit courts, you'll see that's down too. So fewer things are brought to us, you know. Um, I have a big affinity for cases that involving kids. We don't get hardly any, usually because the kids grow up before people want to keep pushing on and, and bringing an issue up to the Supreme Court. Is there any chance that fewer cases are coming to you because of a perception the court is dysfunctional? You know, I would have no way of knowing that, but mm -hmm. I don't believe so. I believe that lawyers who operate in the best interests of their clients, if the issue is wrongly decided below, and the client can afford the price of yet another level of review, we'll bring it forward. Because certainty in the law is a big help to everyone. Uh, that is really one problem I have with mediation, is that there are a lot of issues out there. They get mediated away, and that's good for those parties, but then the issue stays alive. There's still no certainty in the law. It hasn't been decided. Right. Yeah. Could, could I go back to the uh, incident between Justice Prosser and uh, Justice Bradley? You recused yourself from the ethics complaint, yep. um, and I think your reasoning was you were a witness. Um, uh, Professor Fallon says you really didn't need to do that, that under the law you were perfectly able to decide that case. What's your reasoning and what's your response to him? Okay. Well, first of all, we have a statute, 757 19 mm -hmm. b that I cited in my decision. Mm -hmm. I imagine you probably have looked at it. Mm -hmm. um, it says if you are a material witness, you cannot act as a judge. Um, that statute goes on to say that judge within 757.19 includes justices, so it included me. Mm -hmm. um, a material witness is someone who has witnessed something that will be of consequence to the facts in issue in a case, okay? Well, the facts in issue in this case are kind of what happened between Justice Prosser and Justice Bradley. and. Um, I mean, I was there. I physically put myself between the two of them mm -hmm. to keep a bad situation from getting worse and held on to Justice Bradley until she calmed down. It was a very upsetting, personally upsetting incident for me. I've never broken up a fight between adults. I think the last time I broke up a fight was when my son Matthew was about six, wrestling around on the floor with a bunch of his buddies. You know, and they kicked a hole in the drywall, and I said, okay, you guys, outside. You know. So that didn't happen here. <laughs> no. No, no. Well, Matthew's all grown up now. But um, I found it very upsetting, okay, and because I did, I think that's another reason for me not to be involved in decision-making on that case. So I believe that the statute required me to get off. Now, I also looked at the rule of necessity, because I'm, I know what that is, mm -hmm. and I did some research. I could not find a single case where that ever was applied when it was a material witness that was being asked to self-disqualify. Usually that applies like um, oh, there was one case I think that we had where um, a cap on judges' salaries was an issue that was coming before the court. And of course, we're all judges, so it would apply to what they were going to do to our, our salaries and whether you could tax them or couldn't tax them. And so we had a common interest. A common interest is something like, does it affect your financial interest? Mm -hmm. But actually, believing you saw what you saw, that's not, I don't have an interest in the outcome of Justice Prosser's case. Mm -hmm. uh, having a, a common interest, you have an interest in the outcome. Yeah, I think what Professor Fallon argues is yeah. that in this type of case, the law you cite isn't doesn't require recusal. Why? I think his argument is yeah. that the discipline proceeding is neither criminal right. nor civil. Nor civil. Right, right, right. right. That, that's cite, the, I mean, he's raised yeah. this before, I think, yeah. in your oh, forums. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that the yeah. proceeding being yeah. disciplined is, is an animal of something, you know, to, yeah. different stripes, and it's not... Okay. Really, either civil or criminal, okay. to which session yeah. applies. Well, and you know, and I would and I would stay back, say back to that. We have just the common law in Wisconsin that everyone deserves an unbiased and impartial mm -hmm. judge. I, I don't think that includes me in this case. I just think it's inappropriate for me to sit on it. And I do think we have a way of disciplining our own folks. As I told you, I think the court has inherent authority to. 
do something like What do you mean public. by that? You've said that a few times yeah. in inherent authority. What, what, that what? sounds a little bit like rule of necessity. No, it's not really. You know, the court has um, the inherent authority uh, to supervise the judges in, in the courts below. Um, we also have constitutional authority to supervise the judges in the courts below. Um, it's really those things that are necessary to the court as an institution. Um, I don't believe that authority goes as far as removing a judge. I think you have to do that under constitutional provisions because those have already been set out in the framework that we all have to operate within, which is the Wisconsin Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that the letter I suggested would have been appropriate under the court's inherent authority. It was a public apology, but it was also a public acknowledgement of the wrongfulness of the conduct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you get when you go through the Judicial Commission and our court says that conduct deserves you know, an acknowledgement publicly it was wrong. But you say it so, wasn't a consensus with that. Um, yeah. So those who were against the letter, w what did they have to say the reason? We never got together and discussed it. I thought we'd get together, and we still will at some point in time, and tried to figure out if this isn't the way to go, what other suggestions are there? Okay. You know, I work with six smart people. And just because it's my suggestion doesn't mean we have to do it. But I think we need to do something. I, I'm just wondering if did yeah. you do any sort of small, you know, mm -hmm. private focus groups or anything with your own friends to think had you had consensus and had the court issued that apology, what would the public have thought of it? Mm -hmm. Would it have been I, effective? I, I, I mean, mm -hmm. would they have said so what, or would they said well, yeah. finally, great, we can move on? Um, I don't know. It's my personal view. It would depend on how it was presented to the public and if it were presented in a way that was appropriate. I think that's a good that's a good point. And maybe before the court decides what to do, they should do something like that if they come to some agreement about what's the best way of clearing the decks. Do you think it, the deck still needs to be cleared? And is, yeah, I do. Is, 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 it's still hanging over the court, I do. that incident? Right. Well, you see it in the paper all the time. I mean, your paper has it almost every single time you talk about the court. Yeah. It's there. So, okay. you know, I think unless we deal with it, it's going to stay there. And you need to do, deal with it publicly? I think. I mean, in, in terms of getting out to the public and, and explaining your, your I'm case. sorry, I'm not following. The court needs to get out and talk to the public about this. I think individually we need to do that, but I think we need to, as an institution, also speak to the public. Okay. And that's what I was trying to get us to do, is sure. as an institution, speak to the public. I wonder if you could talk about um, the, um, uh, the idea of funding for judicial races. I think uh, in the debate last night, yeah. both of you support public funding. I yeah. um, wonder if you could talk about why you support that and whether that's really an antidote in an era when so much outside money tends to pour into certain races. I'm, we're not sure yet whether that's going to be the case with this race, but it right. certainly has been in the past. Yeah. Well, you know, we all signed on to a letter that said we were, those seven of us, were in favor of meaningful. And we put that word in there for a very big purpose. You know, judges are wordsmiths, and, mm -hmm. and, and we are also. Meaningful public financing. And what we hoped is that there were, if there were meaningful public financing, the candidate could characterize himself or herself to the public. Mm -hmm. You aren't going to change third-party participation because that comes out of mostly Citizens United, which right. is a U.S. Supreme Court case, and yeah. we have no authority to complain about that, deal with it, do anything except follow it. I mean, that's our obligation, so we don't get involved in that. But I think if the candidate can characterize herself or himself to the public, that's a big benefit to the public because mm -hmm. then they know what the qualities of the two candidates are and the public can decide who they think is better suited to the job that actually the candidates are seeking. I mean, getting elected is kind of like a great public job interview. I mean, you're really asking mm -hmm. the public to to hire me to do this work. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I've tried to explain what the work is and why I think my experience really makes me the better qualified of the candidates to do the job of a justice on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And I and, and I thought that's what meaningful public finance would have the ability to do. By meaningful, I, I'm assuming you enough mean to get your, enough to get your Enough name to out. get your, your, your uh, message out, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that possible, though, given the enormous sums that sometimes flow into these races? I you mean, know, I, I don't know. I don't know. 
We haven't tried it, so yeah. we, we don't yeah. know. Is somebody suggested a number of what they thought meaningful would be? No, but you know, you could probably go back and look at what people have spent. The chief mm -hmm. justice spent a million six on her race in a contested race. Mm -hmm. When I ran in two thousand and three, of course that was before third parties were huge. Mm -hmm. We had some on the other side. Oh. I spent around four fifty, four sixty. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's with the less than five hundred. Mm -hmm. It's with the. Uh, um, GAB, so you could find the number mm -hmm. if the exact number is important. So, you know, certainly the amount that needs to be spent has increased if it's gone from that amount to a million six. Uh, and I think the Chief Justice ran in what, 2009, I think, maybe she was up. What do you anticipate spending? You know, I don't know. Uh, it probably depends on how much we raise. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So. We're working on it. We're filing our reports, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know. Real quickly, we go back to just one question about volume. Yeah. You mentioned discipline, uh, lawyer discipline acts. Yeah. Is that something, um, we've written about that too at the paper. Do you yeah. think that's something it, the court does enough of or does uh, substantively enough of in terms of are they strict enough? And there's, there's always the constant feeling that uh, both the OLR and ultimately it's the court I know does the, the sanctions yes. don't do enough or act quickly enough on, on lawyers that shouldn't be practicing. Well, you know, we act when um, OLR brings matters to us. Um, we don't, we're not a proactive body, right. so we only mm -hmm. react. Um, we have looked at whether OLR is bringing things to us as soon as they can. And we now make them report to us every month how many mm -hmm. cases they have outstanding, how many different disciplinary actions. Um, I had thought that maybe it would be a good idea to have OLR triage the complaints that they get um, so that they would proceed on those that are most serious more quickly. I think they tend to do it in the order in which they get them now, um, but maybe not. So. You should probably talk to Keith Saline because I don't get yeah. involved in their internal activities. But well, uh, but the court can impose its own sanctions, right? I mean, you're clear to accept oh, we the referee's do. recommendations or override it. At, we at always times you do. We but. always decide for ourselves what the sanction is going to be. You know, we're not an appellate court in in that regard because these are really original actions mm -hmm. with us. So we get them from the referee whom we appoint, but he's our fact finder or she's our fact finder. We're not reviewing the Court of Appeals decision. We're not reviewing the Circuit Court's decision. So in that respect, this is a different kind of um, operation for the Supreme Court. But I guess my question is if, if the court decided that no matter what the referees come up with and recommend, or OLR is recommending that might d disagree with the referee sometimes. Right, right that decided to just get a lot tougher on sanctions we could. for certain kinds of violations, trust fund yes. violations, which yep. really account to theft a lot of the time and um, really don't seem to always get the kind of punishment you think that would deserve. Do yeah. you think that would send a message and improve practice? Um, I think that we certainly can do that. We could get tougher than we are now. Um, we meet with all our boards that deal with uh, lawyer regulation matters on a regular basis and listen to what they have to say because they're kind of on the front lines and, and determine from there whether we're tough enough or not tough enough. Um, every case is an individual case. So I have a hard time answering your question as a generality because if you have someone that does something like doesn't keep track of the monies in the trust account, but never uses them for an improper purpose, just has bad bookkeeping, that's quite different from someone that actually expends trust account monies for a purpose that they didn't go into the trust account for. So I, I don't know if I've helped you with the answer or not. I want to get back to the issue of uh, money and judicial races again. Sure. Um, Given that, and given the sort of tone of some of the campaigns, I would not characterize the current one in that manner. But certainly, that's there have been some uh, races in the past that have been pretty tough. Uh, is that an argument, in your view, ever for an appointed system of justices rather than what we have now? Okay. Now I'll start. I'll answer you, but I have to start with a disclaimer. I was never involved with political things before I became a judge on the Court of Appeals. So I could never have had the opportunity I have if we had an appointed system 
I didn't know anybody that was closely connected to the governor. I was never closely connected to the governor, so I never would have gotten appointed to anything. Mm -hmm. So, and I absolutely love my job. So mm -hmm. I have to start out by saying I got. So you have a little bias. I have a little bias <laughs> right there. Okay, so having set that aside, you know, it's it's a constitutional right of the people to elect their judges. And when the Constitution was put together, there were a lot of discussions about having an appointive system because that's what they have federally. Our Constitution mm -hmm. is largely mo modeled on the mm -hmm. federal Constitution. There were a lot of discussions, and it was decided that in Wisconsin, they wanted to elect all of their public servants, not just those that are in the political branches, but those in the judiciary as well. So it's a constitutional right of the people. Now. Saying that some campaigns have not, I don't want to say not been appropriate. I, I don't happen to like negative campaigning. I think you'll see I'm running a positive campaign. I always have run a positive campaign. Not interested in dissing my opponents. I want to tell the people why I think I'm a better person for the job. I don't think you take a right away from the people because somebody else is behaving in a way that's distasteful. Mm -hmm. I just don't think you do that. What's your, as you travel around in your campaign, what's your perception or, or what do you think, the, how does the public perceive the court and how has that shaped your message? Um, I think the public is largely unknowing about what the court really does. I don't think a lot of the members of the public have a, a real strong opinion of the court one way or the other. I think if they know anything about the court, um, they may know about the incident between Justice Prosser and Justice Bradley because it's so doggone shocking. I mean, it, it, it's shocking to everybody. And it's in your newspaper all the time. <laughs> so they, you know, if they read the papers, it's, it's reinforced on a regular basis. Um, but the public is very open. You know, I'm doing a lot now, but it's been my habit since I got on actually the Court of Appeals to go out and talk to the public. So I've always gone and talked to the Rotary and the Kiwanis and the Lions. I was at West Dallas High School, you know, a little bit ago. They wanted to do a program on the courts. So I'm happy to go and talk about the courts. Most people don't know much about what the court does. Um, most people, before somebody in their organization asked me to come and speak, knew who I was or that I was a justice on the Supreme Court. So I think the public awareness of the court and what it does altogether is is not real strong. And I think you see that in the turnout in judicial races. You know, people always tell me, oh, I don't vote in those races. I follow the law and I'm not a lawyer and, you know, I'm busy. I don't have time to go vote. And I always try to persuade them that, you know, it does affect you, especially at the Supreme Court level, because we would not take a case unless it were of statewide concern, which means it does affect more than the people who are in court. Um, but I don't think, as I go around, that the public has a negative view of the court. Um, I talk to Rotary and I talk to Kiwanis and I take questions after I talk and basically I just tell them what does the court do and why should you pay attention and how does it affect your lives, kind of that sort of thing. Um, but I'm always warmly received by the public. I don't get grumpy looks or nasty questions. I often get a question about the mm -hmm. incident with Justice Prosser and Justice Bradley and I try to answer it as honestly as I can telling them I'm not involved in, in that anymore. And uh, But the question is usually asked because it's almost like, did that really happen? Kind of question. And I have to say, unfortunately, yes, it really happened. Um, but I don't get bad vibes from them. I, you know, the public treats me very well as I go around the state. I have absolutely no complaints at all. The perception probably is that you're a conservative member of the court. Would you characterize yourself that way? How do you describe your yeah. judicial approach? You know, I don't like labels. Um, I think that they're too often a shortcut and leave out understanding of what actually occurs. But I'll be happy to tell you what my judicial approach is. Um, my philosophy on how a justice on the Supreme Court should decide cases and controversies that come before the court is set by the framework established by the Wisconsin Constitution. That Constitution established how we operate as uh, judicial officers within the state. And it set up three separate and independent branches of government. I'm part of the judicial branch, I think is very important. Then there's a legislative branch. I am not a part of that branch. And of course, the executive branch headed up by the governor. I'm not a part of that branch either. However, 
The way I exercise my office will show what respect I give to those other branches of government. Now there are some functions that are by the Constitution delegated to another branch of government. Um, if you look at the legislative power of the state shall reside in the Senate and the Assembly. That's what our Constitution says. That means I don't have it. I'm not in that branch. I'm not a part of those organizations. Well, how does that fit in with my decision making? Probably the most common task of a Supreme Court justice is to interpret a statute. You know, the legislature, they decide they want to fix a problem or they want to help a particular group or they want to make Wisconsin better for all of us and they go around the state and they talk to a lot of people and they pass a law. Now, nobody ever likes all the laws they pass. I don't even like all the laws they pass. It's not my job to like or not like. But when people disagree about what that law means, eventually it can come up to our court. And it comes up in every context. Last term we did one on child support. We've done one on last year, I think we also did one on workers' compensation. Always statutory interpretation. What does the statute mean? Well, I believe I have to show respect for the choices the legislature made as a policy matter. You know, what were they trying to do? So when a case comes up before the court, and we have to say, what does the statute mean? Well, we've got a really smart lawyer on one side, and she's saying it means this, and we've got an equally smart lawyer on the other side. He's saying she doesn't know what she's talking about, so we've got to decide. I try to figure out what was the legislature trying to do when they enacted the statute, and I try as best I can to interpret the statute consistent with what they were trying to do. I don't try to change what they were trying to do because I think it wasn't a good idea or I think the policy is bad for Wisconsin. I don't do that. I try very hard to stick with what the legislature was trying to do. Now, you know, I don't know, does that make me conservative or liberal? I don't think it makes me anything. Mm -hmm. I think it makes me someone that believes that my office doesn't leak into making policy choices for the legislature just because I didn't think it was a very good choice for the state. That's often referred to as judicial restraint. Okay, well would, that's would, what I would, that's what you, I do. Yeah. You, then. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think it makes you a liberal or conservative. It just I just really feel that's what my office is is driven by is the Constitution. I try my best to, to operate that way. Are there justices on the court who disagree with you about that? You know, you should probably ask them. Okay. <laughs> Uh, your opponent has said that if he was elected, he would try to reverse uh, a court rule that says that justices do not have to step aside in cases involving parties who gave them political donations. What's, what's your view on that rule? I think you voted to change it from the previous rule. What's your thinking on that? Well, first of all, I don't think that the rule was a change from the previous rule. I okay. think the wording was an attempt to clarify. You know, when Justice Butler was on our court, he his committee, because judges don't take contributions, his committee accepted donations from, I can't tell you the name of the organization, I wish I'd looked at that, but you can look up the case. Um, anyway, from, from people who were on the board of directors of an organization that was before the court, and also from the lawyer, lawyer was Lester Pines, that I remember, gave donations to him. After the case was decided, we had a motion to say that he was um, self-disqualified by law, the same kind of motion that is made when you try to get a judge off a case. So therefore, we should re-decide the case without Justice Butler being a part of the case. And it was a four to three case, it would have it would have made a difference, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we looked at it and we reviewed a lot of other cases. And if you go back, gosh, I wish, I can send you the name of the case if you want it, but I wish I, I could think of it and I cannot. Was it the lead paint case? No, 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 mm -mm. It, inv it involves some kind of an organization that had something to do, I don't know, I'll have to send you the name okay. of the, I'll have to send you the name of the case. But the issue was, he should have gotten off. He shouldn't mm -hmm. have participated. Mm -hmm. We went through, we issued a written decision saying, and there was no statement that it was quid pro quo, that Justice Butler decided the case in a biased manner because he got this contribution. That wasn't the argument. The argument was simply because he got the contribution, he should have gotten off. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, simply taking a lawful contribution, and this was a lawful contribution, there was no question about that, by itself with nothing more, is not grounds for um, 
requiring a judge to step aside from a case. What's, what's the reason for that? The reason for that is that the legislature has established what are lawful contributions. This contribution was within those limits. And if you were to say that any time a judge would take a lawful contribution, that person had to get off, the law would be quite subject to manipulation. Now, at the time that Justice Butler was there, the contribution limit was $10,000 for a person and I think $86.25 for a pack. The contributions he got were nowhere near that. So but if you were to make a donation yeah, and just and get, try you to get you off, get you off the case. absolutely, okay. absolutely. So okay. that's a danger that's on the other side of all of that. But doesn't it create the perception? That's why public financing would be great. Then you wouldn't be taking yeah, any. Right. But doesn't that create in, in 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 the public side perhaps the perception that it's sort of tainted or something? You know, I hope not. I don't believe that people give contributions to judges or justices to cause them to decide one way or the other. I think they give contributions because they believe that judge's approach to the law is consistent with what they think the judge's approach ought to be. So I think to say it causes a result is putting the cart before the horse. I think the, the contribution comes because you've studied the judge's view either on certain areas of law that are important to you. Uh, you know, how about uh, uh, Public records law. Mm -hmm. It's probably something that's important to you. Don't you study the judge's views on that and decide that you think one judge is doing it right and the other judges that are going the other way are not? I mean, I think that's how contributions are made. That's my perception. Now, I think that that you can drive the public's opinion if you keep writing about it and saying, hey, you know, this person gave $500, therefore the judge is biased on this decision. I think if you're going to do that, you're going to have to get into public financing because what you're doing then is you are diminishing the court as an institution. And I think that's a bad way to go. I think everybody loses when that's the drumbeat, no matter what what you're pushing on it with. I think that's a bad message. Yeah. Good. At the Rotary Club uh, yesterday, um, you were critical of your opponent for saying at one point that he would represent the interests of working people. Yeah. What What's your uh, concern there? Yeah. Well, first of all, it, you don't, when you're a justice, you don't represent any group. You basically just apply the law. It doesn't matter, you know, what group is bringing it before you. In regard to working families, my dad was a steel worker in the steel mills of Joliet, Illinois for 30 years. My mom taught school initially on a certificate because she didn't have a college degree, and she graduated from college when I was a junior in high school, going to school weekends and nights. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit about working class families from firsthand knowledge, but I don't represent anybody when I'm on that court. I try to represent the rule of law and fairly and even handedly decide every case, no matter who brings it. So I think that saying you're going on the court to represent working families. To me, it sounds like you should run for the legislature. I mean, that's where you represent groups and try to get their interests pushed in legislation and stuff. That's not what you do as a justice. In the primary, uh, Vince Magna, who lost in the primary, uh, was quite open about his own partisan connections mm -hmm. and said that you and um, Professor Fallon should be as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? Uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, looking at the contributors to your campaign and also to Mr. Fallon's campaign, they do line up in a partisan fashion. Uh, he's tended to get money more from the liberal groups. You're getting money from Club for Growth and other more conservative groups. Is there a charade here? You know, I don't think there's a charade. First of all, most people that support me don't give me any money, either okay. because they can't afford it or they're just they just don't give their money to political kinds of things. Maybe they give their discretionary money to charitable kind of things, and mm -hmm. I think that's a valid choice for people to make. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can look at the money and say, I mean, if you look at the donors on both sides, I would bet you find out you don't have very many, nothing compared to the votes that are cast. So mm -hmm. um, secondly, the legislature has designated that we run nonpartisan. Now, what does that mean? Well, my experience is that partisans remain interested in judicial races. Some people just like politics, and this is politics, even though it's nonpartisan. Right. I've tried very, very hard to have people on my endorsements list that are acknowledged Republicans and acknowledged Democrats, and a ton of people I have no idea who they are or what they are. <clears throat> people who are seen as quite liberal, Peter Earle of Milwaukee, he's a supporter of mine. 
I don't think you would say he's conservative. I mean, mm -hmm. he has more liberal kinds of views. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Mike Greeby is a supporter of mine. I don't think that you would say that, you know, his views were consistent perhaps with Peter Earle's. But most of the people, I don't know what their views are, but I've tried to get people that I can identify for the public. I've tried to make my campaign inclusive. <clears throat> 53 sheriffs have supported me, Democrats and Republicans. You know, they do that because they believe, looking at my record, that over the years I fairly and evenly applied the law to all who come before the courts. Same thing with district attorneys. I have Republicans and Democrats, you know. And I just named a couple of private persons, but that's the way I have tried very hard to deal with this campaign. So I think what you do when you're running nonpartisan is to try to run a campaign that's inclusive that you reach out to Democrats, you reach out to Republicans, and then you just reach out to the Kiwanis and the Rotary and the, you know, um, you know the Milwaukee uh, Professional Police Association has endorsed me. Now, they're in Milwaukee. Milwaukee is known to be more Democrat than Republican. I would bet more of those people are probably Democrats than Republicans. I don't know. I don't really know what any of them are, to be frank with you. I, I don't make that a request. I try to have people that I know are affiliated with one party or the other and ask for their support. And then everybody else, I don't ask them. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions, Bruce? Okay. Yeah. Uh, finally, maybe you could just take a minute and sort of make the case for your election. Okay. Well, I really think this race is about experience and judicial philosophy, and I've already explained my judicial philosophy to you. In regard to experience, the experience that's important here is the experience that bears on the work of a Supreme Court justice. So what, what do I do? I mean, what is really my job? I'm sure you know a lot about it, but I bet you don't know all about it. I probably spend 80% of my time deciding whether another judge properly applied the law. And in order to do that, I have to know what they were supposed to be doing when they got the case that I'm now reviewing. Well, you know, it's a big help to me, first of all, that I sat on the Court of Appeals. It's a big help because most of the cases we get come from the Court of Appeals. So I know what they should have been looking at. I know where in the record they should have been checking given the issue that's coming up before us. I know what kind of a standard of review they should have applied to that issue having sat there a long time. And I know where things might have gotten off the track. So that knowledge permits me to give really a more in-depth review of the cases that come. And when we sit around, like we're sitting around here talking, I bring things like this up to my my colleagues. Well, maybe they got off the track over here. Let's look and see what, did they say what standard of review they were applying? And if they said it, is the decision consistent with what that standard requires? Maybe that's where we should be looking. So we try to give a thorough review. And I'm the only justice on the Supreme Court who's ever sat on the Court of Appeals. So I know that internal process, that's very helpful to us because that's mostly where, where the um, decisions come from. Once we, once we uh, decide to take a case, then experience matters in a couple of other ways, too. Um, it, it, it matters in regard to breadth of substantive experience. You know, we talked a little bit about the Supreme Court doesn't take a ton of cases, 60 give or take. But we take cases from all substantive areas of the law. You know, as I said, last year we did a workers' compensation case on a uh, child support case. We did a public records case. We do all manners of criminal cases, anything involving employment. Anything that wanders through the court system can come to the Supreme Court. Well. The Court of Appeals is very different. It takes everything. So having sat there for seven years, everything has bumped up against the Court of Appeals. You can really take a speeding ticket there if you want to take a speeding mm -hmm. ticket. And when I was there, I believe we had somebody that was complaining about the radar wasn't right. You know, I mean, so you, you have a right to go there. That's helpful as a Supreme Court Justice because you get all those substantive areas of law where you may not have practiced yourself, but you've seen the issues. You've been involved in those cases. So when it comes to the Supreme Court, it only takes three of us to decide if we're going to take a Court of Appeals case. If I've seen an issue that's now we're asked to decide and take the case, and it was bouncing around in the Court of Appeals, even though we haven't seen it before in the Supreme Court, I can say, you know what, this was there before. This is not a, uh, this is an open issue for the public. We would do the public a service if we took this case. 
And that's helpful to my colleagues. And since it takes only three, I can usually get two other people to say, well, yeah, maybe we should take the case. We don't want that question causing more and more litigation for the public. If we can add certainty to the law, we take it. So it's helpful there. Mm -hmm. Then if we take a case, you know, being an appellate judge is very different from being a trial court judge. The worst thing for an appellate judge is not knowing what it is you don't know. And that comes into effect if we're deciding the case. We want to decide the issue we took it for, and we want to make it certain for the public. What we don't want to do is goof up something over here that the way we say the first issue affects an issue that's not before us. You know, if we're interpreting an insurance contract, there are very specific rules of law that we apply to that interpretation. They're different than how we interpret a contract of employment. So if we're doing an insurance contract, we have to be careful in how we word that in our decision. So whether I'm writing the decision or one of my colleagues is writing it, we all review it and talk about it. And we, we help each other with that. And I have broad knowledge of substantive law. And I can often point out, you know, we better change the wording here a little bit because a smart lawyer is going to pick that out. It's going to use it for something that we never intended. We need to narrow the wording. So that's a help to my colleagues, too. And they have areas of strength that they bring in in a similar fashion. So having broad substantive law experience is, is really very important. And, and because I've spent almost 17 years now as an appellate judge, I have very, very broad experience. So I have broad substantive experience, and I have tons of experience deciding cases and knowing what a judge should have done to accurately apply the law. You know, if your car is missing and you take it to a mechanic, you say, my car is missing, and tell him what's wrong, and you leave it with him, and come back at the end of the day, he said, yep, I got it all fixed, all taken care of, and you drive it home, it seems fine, and three days later, you start it up, and it's missing again. What do you do? You take it to another mechanic, and you say, did that guy fix my car right? It's doing the same thing I just paid him to fix it. Well, judging is not so different. You take it to a mechanic because he knows what should have been looked at, what should have been examined, given the symptoms you're saying. When you're a judge and they bring you a legal issue and you've done judging before, you see the problems they're presenting as symptoms. So you go back and you look and see, did the judge below do what he or she should have done? Is there a problem? How can that problem be corrected if there is one? And how can you say it in a way that will clarify the law without confusing some other area of law because you operate at an appellate level? So I, I really think that experience is very helpful to doing the job of a Supreme Court justice. I think, I think having someone from the Court of Appeals, well, it's really unique knowledge that nobody else can bring to the fore. We have four trial court judges, but I'm the only one from the Court of Appeals. So I think I have something special. Also, I have worked so hard to try to make the court more responsive to the citizens, to try to get the court to change in ways that will help it do that. Sometimes it's like trying to turn a <laughs> aircraft carrier with a tugboat. But, but I keep trying to suggest ways that we might better serve the public. And, and I think that's important. I, I think that's important. I, don't, I think you know, you have, you're given an opportunity that it's a wonderful opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's just a wonderful opportunity. So I try very hard to make the court focus outward as much as I can and look at, can we do our job in a way that's a better service to the public? Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank and you for luck. taking the time. Sure. Thank, thank you. you.